For something moving in a circle, only one condition needs to be satisfied. There must be a force that continuously acts at 90 degrees to the object's velocity or direction of motion. That means that its velocity and direction of travel constantly changes, but it still travels at a constant speed. As velocity is a vector, it's still accelerating because the direction of the velocity is changing, even though the magnitude of the velocity, the speed, is not. This centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r, where r is the radius of the circle. As f equals ma, the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. As speed is equal to distance over time, we can calculate it by doing circumference divided by the time period, so 2 pi r over t. It's also useful to consider its angular velocity, also known as angular speed or angular frequency. That's how many radians of the orbit are covered every second. We give it the symbol omega, a curly w. As that's equal to 2 pi over t, how many radians per second, that means that v equals omega r. This is a very important equation that people often forget. As normal frequency is 1 over the time period, omega also equals 2 pi f. Replacing v in our centripetal acceleration and force equation, with this we end up with the alternative equations a equals omega squared r and f equals m omega squared r. If you're given the time period, you use the omega version and replace the omega with 2 pi over t. If you're given the actual speed though, you use the first equation, a equals v squared over r or f equals mv squared over r. Similar to angular velocity, angular displacement is just how many radians an object has turned through. Like we know from waves, to turn degrees into radians, we divide by 360 to turn into whole circles or whole cycles, then multiply by 2 pi to turn it into radians. If it's a vertical loop, like a loop-to-loop -loop on a roller coaster, you have to take into account the support force or reaction force of the track we might call our S. At the bottom, mg is pulling down and S is pushing up. The centripetal force is one minus the other, the resultant of the two forces. At the top, both are pulling down, meaning the centripetal force equals S plus mg instead. In both cases, we usually then equate these to mv squared over r. When it's at either side, weight isn't contributing to the centripetal force at all, therefore S is equal to mv squared over r. A car on a banked track or a banking plane can be tricky, but just remember that it's different from a normal mass on a slope situation. The main force here is the perpendicular reaction force of the track, or the upthrust of the plane, which is at an angle. These forces need to, of course, supply a vertical component that is equal to the weight, mg. Usually, we need to find out what the centripetal force is, which is pointing towards the centre of the circular track, or the plane's circular path. Drawing a triangle shows that this horizontal force is equal to mg tan theta, as we have the opposite and adjacent sides. This is then equal to mv squared over r, and you can see that the m's cancel too. Simple harmonic motion describes any object that is oscillating around a point, like a pendulum or a mass on a spring. There are two conditions. The acceleration must be proportional to the object's displacement from equilibrium, and it must be in the opposite direction to the displacement. What's true for acceleration is also true for the force. It's trying to return the object to equilibrium, hence why we call it the restoring force. The equation a equals minus omega squared x shows both of these conditions. As we know from circular motion, omega is equal to 2 pi f, well 2 pi over t, and x is the displacement from equilibrium in meters. If we use calculus in A-level physics, we derive this from the other equation you'll see in a minute, but as we don't, we can just use it as our jumping off point for SHM. In calculations, we're never really concerned with the minus, as we know it's going to change from negative to positive as it oscillates. The maximum acceleration occurs at the maximum displacement, which you know is the amplitude, capital A. So little a max equals omega squared big A. We've just swapped out displacement for amplitude. If you draw a graph of how displacement changes with time for something undergoing SHM, like a pendulum, we end up with a sine graph. To be clear, it's sine if it starts at zero, cos if it starts at amplitude. Many people don't realise that these are the same thing, just shifted 90 degrees. At any time, the displacement x is equal to a fraction of the amplitude. That fraction is given by sine or cos omega t. Be careful, when using sine or cos with any periodic motion like circular or SHM, your calculator must be in radian mode. The full equation for velocity at any point is this, plus or minus omega times root a squared minus x squared. Luckily, it's highly unlikely you'll have to use this, as more often than not, we're just concerned with the maximum velocity, which it has at equilibrium, where x equals zero. So that means v max equals omega a, or 2 pi fa.
This is an important equation because it allows us to find the maximum kinetic energy if we use this speed in half mv squared, and the maximum kinetic energy is equal to the total energy of the system. Going back to our graph quickly, this is essentially distance against time, so if you're asked to find the maximum speed from it, you could draw a tangent at equilibrium and you'll get the maximum gradient, but the far more accurate method is to get the time period and amplitude from the graph, then calculate Vmax equals 2 pi fa, which is the same as 2 pi a over t. As the object moves away from equilibrium, kinetic energy is turned into potential energy. In the case of a pendulum, that's gravitational potential energy, of course. Be careful with displacement for a pendulum, though. The displacement is roughly a straight line from equilibrium to where it is. It's not the vertical height it's moved. That means that if you're given the maximum height of a pendulum, the only thing you can do with that is find the GPE and equate that to kinetic energy in order to find Vmax. Height is not amplitude for a pendulum. You can then find out more about the oscillations using Vmax equals 2 pi fa. If there is no damping or resonance, and it's a closed system, no energy should be lost to the surroundings, which means the total energy stays the same as kinetic energy and potential energy do their balancing act. We have two equations for the time period of a pendulum and mass on a spring. For a pendulum, t is equal to 2 pi root L over g, where L is the length of the string, to be precise from the pivot to the centre of the bob, and g is gravitational field strength. Note that there is no mass in this. It doesn't affect the time period, or therefore the frequency either. For a spring, t equals 2 pi root m over k, where k is the spring constant. These equations often crop up in proportionality multiple choice questions, for example. What would happen to the frequency of a pendulum if you doubled the length? Well, the time period would go up by a factor of root 2, which means the frequency would do the opposite. The pendulum equation is a slight approximation, though, as it assumes the motion is along a straight line, which is why if we measure the time for 10 oscillations in an experiment and divide by 10 to get an accurate time period, we must use a small angle, say less than 10 degrees. Use a large angle and the model breaks down. The pendulum's motion isn't circular motion, however, as it passes through equilibrium, it is for a brief moment. This allows us to get Vmax and use that in our circular motion equation, F equals mv squared over r. And that gives us the centripetal force, which is going to be the tension in the string, take away the weight. In reality, there are resistive forces, like air resistance, that oppose the motion of the object moving. It always acts in the opposite direction to the velocity. It's a damping force. It removes energy from the system. If we draw what happens to oscillations over time, we can see that the amplitude decreases gradually. This is what we call light damping. Sometimes you'll see a line that joins the peaks together, which shows us exactly how the amplitude is changing over time. You could be asked to state how much energy is left at a certain time. In that case, just remember that Vmax is proportional to the amplitude and energy is proportional to V squared. So that means that energy is proportional to amplitude squared. So if the amplitude has halved, that means the energy will have courted. If the resistive force is a lot larger, the object won't even get a chance to oscillate. Its displacement will just gradually decrease. This is like if you grab someone on a swing to let them down slowly. We call this heavy damping or over damping. Critical damping is when the damping force is applied just as the object reaches equilibrium, ensuring that it comes to a stop at equilibrium as quickly as possible. This would be like you grabbing someone on a swing as they reach the bottom. Shock absorbers in car suspension are designed to do this as much as possible, so the wheels move upwards when going over a bump, but go straight back down to where they're supposed to be equilibrium, so the car is affected as little as possible. Resonance is the opposite. It's when an external force is driving the oscillations, increasing the amplitude, adding energy into the system. We say this only happens when a system is lightly damped. Maximum resonance happens when the frequency of the driving force matches the natural or resonant frequency of the system. That's the frequency it would oscillate at without the driving force. The driving force frequency can also be a multiple of the natural frequency and you'll still get substantial resonance. When resonance occurs, the driving force and the restoring force are 90 degrees out of phase with each other, which means the driving force pushes most when the object is at equilibrium, much like the wheel under a swinging pirate ship ride, pushing it higher and higher every swing. If you draw a graph of amplitude against driving frequency f, we get the highest amplitude, the most resonance, when it's equal to the natural or resonant frequency f0. If you add more damping, the height of that peak decreases as you reduce the effect of resonance. Note that the peak doesn't get any narrower though. Leave a like if you found this helpful. I've also put together these into videos that cover whole papers to help you revise for your exams more effectively. Click on the card for your board if it's there, or go to my channel for more, including international boards.